Hello, lovely person. Today, I wanted to share with you a poem that has been one of my favorites for a very, very long time. It's a very long poem, but the poem itself is broken up into six different parts. So I'm going to be reading that and releasing it in five different videos. And I wanted to do it now because I know I like that. So here we go, and I hope you enjoy it. The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde. So here we go, and I hope you enjoy it. The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde, part one. He did not wear his scarlet coat, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. He walked amongst the trial men in a suit of shabby gray. A cricket cap was on his head and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky. And at every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by. I walked with other souls in pain within another ring, and was wondering if the man had done a great or little thing, when a voice behind me whispered low, that fellow's got to swing. Dear Christ, the very prison walls suddenly seemed to reel, and the sky above my head became like a cask of scorching steel. And though I was a soul in pain, my pain I could not feel. I only knew what hunted thought quickened his step and why he looked upon the garish day with such a wistful eye. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. Yet each man kills the thing he loves, by each let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. Some kill their love when they are young and some when they are old. Some strangle with the hands of lust, some with the hands of gold. The kindest use a knife because the dead so soon grow cold. Some love too little, some too long, some sell and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears and some without a sigh. For each man kills the thing he loves, yet each man does not die. He does not die a death of shame on a day of dark disgrace, nor have a noose about his neck, nor a cloth upon his face, nor drop feet foremost through the floor into an empty space. He does not sit with silent men who watch him night and day, who watch him when he tries to weep and when he tries to pray, who watch him lest himself should rob the prison of its prey. He does not wake at dawn to see dread figures throng his room, the shivering chaplain robed in white, the sheriff stern with gloom, and the governor all in shiny black with a yellow face of doom. He does not rise in piteous haste to put on convict clothes, while some coarse-mouthed doctor gloats and notes each new and nerve-twitched pose, fingering a watch whose little ticks are like horrible hammer blows. He does not know that sickening thirst that sands one's throat before the hangman with his gardener's gloves slips through the padded door and binds one with three leathern thongs that the throat may thirst no more. He does not bend his head to hear the burial office read, nor while the terror of his soul tells him he is not dead, cross his own coffin as he moves into the hideous shed. He does not stare upon the air through a little roof of glass. He does not pray with lips of clay for his agony to pass nor feel upon his shuddering cheek the kiss of Caiaphas. That's the end of part one, 
and I'll see you tomorrow for part two. Thanks for watching. Bye. The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde, part two. Six weeks our guardsman walked the yard in the suit of shabby gray. His cricket cap was on his head and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky and at every wandering cloud that trailed its raveled fleeces by. He did not wring his hands as do those witless men who dare to try to rear the changeling hope in the cave of black despair. He only looked upon the sun and drank the morning air. He did not wring his hands nor weep, nor did he peek or pine, but he drank the air as though it held some healthful anodyne. With open mouth, he drank the sun as though it had been wine. And I and all the souls in pain who tramped the other ring forgot if we ourselves had done a great or little thing and watched with gaze of dull amaze the man who had to swing. And strange it was to see him pass with a step so light and gay. And strange it was to see him look so wistfully at the day. And strange it was to think that he had such a debt to pay. For oak and elm have pleasant leaves that in the springtime shoot. But grim to see is the gallows tree with its adder bitten root. And green or dry, a man must die before it bears its fruit. The loftiest place is that seat of grace for which all worldlings try. But who would stand in hempen band upon a scaffold high and through a murderer's collar take his last look at the sky? It is sweet to dance to violins when love and life are fair. To dance to flutes, to dance to lutes is delicate and rare. But it is not sweet with nimble feet to dance upon the air. So with curious eyes and sick surmise, we watched him day by day and wondered if each one of us would end the self same way. For none can tell to what red hell his sightless soul may stray. At last the dead man walked no more amongst the trial men. And I knew that he was standing up in the black dock's dreadful pen and that never would I see his face in God's sweet world again. Like two doomed ships that pass in storm, we had crossed each other's way, but we made no sign, we said no word, we had no word to say, for we did not meet in the holy night, but in the shameful day. A prison wall was round us both, Two outcast men we were. The world had thrust us from its heart and God from out his care. And the iron gin that waits for sin had caught us in its snare. That was the end of part two. I'll see you for part three tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Bye. The wit was there, he took the air beneath the leaden sky. And by each side a warder walked for fear the man might die. Or else he sat with those who watched his anguish night and day. Who watched him when he rose to weep and when he crouched to pray. Who watched him lest himself should rob their scaffold of its prey. The governor was strong upon the regulations act. The doctor said that death was but a scientific fact. And twice a day the chaplain called and left a little tract. And twice a day he smoked his pipe and drank his quart of beer. His soul was resolute and held no hiding place for fear. He often said that he was glad the hangman's hands were near. But why he said so strange a thing no warder dared to ask. For he to whom a watcher's doom is given as his task must set a lock upon his lips and make his face a mask. Or else he might be moved and try to comfort or console. 
And what should human pity do, pent up in murderer's hole? What word of grace in such a place could help a brother's soul? With slouch and swing around the ring, we trod the fool's parade. We did not care. We knew we were the devil's own brigade. And shaven head and feet of lead make a merry masquerade. We tore the tarry rope to shreds with blunt and bleeding nails. We rubbed the doors and scrubbed the floors and cleaned the shining rails. And rank by rank, we soaped the plank and clattered with the pails. We sewed the sacks, we broke the stones, we turned the dusty drill. We banged the tins and bawled the hymns and sweated on the mill. But in the heart of every man, terror was lying still. So still it lay that every day crawled like a weed-clogged wave. And we forgot the bitter lot that waits for fool and knave. Till once as we tramped in for work, we passed an open grave. With yawning mouth, the yellow hole gaped for a living thing. The very mud cried out for blood to the thirsty asphalt ring. And we knew that ere one dawn grew fair, some prisoner had to swing. Right in we went, with soul intent on death and dread and doom. The hangman with his little bag went shuffling through the gloom, and each man trembled as he crept into his numbered tomb. That night the empty corridors were full of forms of fear, and up and down the iron town stole feet we could not hear, and through the bars that hide the stars white faces seemed to peer. He lay as one who lies in dreams in a pleasant meadowland, the watchers watched him as he slept and could not understand how one could sleep so sweet a sleep with a hangman close at hand. But there is no sleep when men must weep who never yet have wept. So we, the fool, the fraud, the knave, that endless vigil kept. And through each brain on hands of pain, another's terror crept. Alas, it is a fearful thing to feel another's guilt. For right within the sword of sin pierced to its poisoned hilt. And as molten lead were the tears we shed for the blood we had not spilt. Warders with their shoes of felt crept by each padlocked door and peeped and saw with eyes of awe gray figures on the floor and wondered why men knelt to pray who never prayed before. All through the night we knelt and prayed, mad mourners of a course. The troubled plumes of midnight were the plumes upon a hearse, and bitter wine upon a sponge was the savor of remorse. The gray cock crew, the red cock crew, but never came the day and crooked shapes of terror crouched in the corners where we lay, and each evil sprite that walks by night before us seemed to play. They glided past, they glided fast, like travelers through a mist. They mocked the moon in a rigadoon of delicate turn and twist, and with formal pace and loathsome grace, the phantoms kept their tryst. With mop and mow, we saw them go, slim shadows hand in hand. About, about, in ghostly rout, they trod a saraband, and the damned grotesques made arabesques like the wind upon the sand. With the pirouettes of marionettes, they tripped on pointed tread, but with flutes of fear, they filled the ear as their grisly mask they led. And loud they sang, and long they sang, for they sang to wake the dead. Oh ho, they cried, the world is wide, but fettered limbs go lame. And once or twice to throw the dice is a gentlemanly game, but he does not win who plays with sin in the secret house of shame. No things of air these antics were that frolicked with such glee to men whose lives were held in jives and whose feet might not go free. 
Ugh, wounds of Christ, they were living things, most terrible to see. Around, around, they waltzed and wound, some wheeled and smirking pairs, with the mincing step of a demerette, some sidled up the stairs, and with subtle sneer and fawning leer, each helped us at our prayers. The morning wind began to moan, but still the night went on. Through its giant loom, the web of gloom crept till each thread was spun. And as we prayed, we grew afraid of the justice of the sun. The moaning wind went round and round the weeping prison wall, till like a wheel of turning steel, we felt the minutes crawl. Oh, moaning wind, what had we done to have such a seneschal? At last I saw the shadowed bars, like a lattice wrought in lead, move right across the whitewashed wall that faced my three-plank bed. And I knew that somewhere in the world, God's dreadful dawn was red. At six o'clock, we cleaned our cells. At seven, all was still. With the softened swing of a mighty wing, the prison seemed to fill. For the Lord of death with icy breath had entered in to kill. He did not pass in purple pomp, nor ride a moon-white steed. Three yards of cord and a sliding board are all the gallows need. So with rope of shame, the herald came to do the secret deed. We were as men who through a fen of filthy darkness grope. We did not dare to breathe a prayer or to give our anguish scope. Something was dead in each of us, and what was dead was hope. For man's grim justice goes its way and will not swerve aside. It slays the weak, it slays the strong, it has a deadly stride. With iron heel, it slays the strong, a monstrous parasite. We waited for the stroke of eight. Each tongue was thick with thirst. For the stroke of eight is the stroke of fate that makes a man accursed. And fate will use a runny noose for the best man and the worst. We had no other thing to do save to wait for the sign to come. So like things of stone in a valley lone, quiet we sat and dumb. But each man's heart beat thick and quick, like a madman on a drum. With sudden shock, the prison clock smote on the shivering air. And from all the jail rose up a wail of impotent despair. Like the sound that frightened marshes here from some leper in his lair. And as one sees most fearful things in the crystal of a dream, we saw the greasy hempen rope hooked to the blackened beam and heard the prayer the hangman's snare strangled into a scream. The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde, part four. There is no chapel on the day on which they hang a man. The chaplain's heart is far too sick or his face is far too wan, or there is that written in his eyes which none should look upon. So they kept us close till nigh on noon, and then they rang the bell, and the warders with their jingling keys opened each listening cell, and down the iron stair we tramped, each from his separate hell. Out into God's sweet air we went, but not in wanted way, for this man's face was white with fear, and that man's face was gray. And I never saw sad men who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw sad men who looked with such a wistful eye. Upon that little tent of blue we prisoners called a sky. And at every careless cloud that passed in happy freedom by. But there were those amongst us all who walked with downcast head and knew that had each got his due, they should have died instead. He had but killed a thing that lived, whilst they had killed the dead. For he who sins a second time wakes a dead soul to pain, 
and draws it from its spotted shroud and makes it bleed again and makes it bleed great gouts of blood and makes it bleed in vain. Like ape or clown in monstrous garb with crooked arrows starred, silently we went round and round the slippery asphalt yard. Silently we went round and round and no man spoke a word. Silently we went round and round and through each hollow mind, the memory of dreadful things rushed like a dreadful wind and horror stalked before each man, and terror crept behind. The warders strutted up and down and kept their herd of brutes. Their uniforms were spick and span and they wore their Sunday suits. But we knew the work they had been at by the quicklime on their boots. For where a grave had opened wide, there was no grave at all only a stretch of mud and sand by the hideous prison wall, and a little heap of burning lime that the man should have his pall. For he has a pall, this wretched man, such as few men can claim, deep down below a prison yard, naked for greater shame. He lies with fetters on each foot, wrapped in a sheet of flame. And all the while the burning lime eats flesh and bone away. It eats the brittle bone by night and the soft flesh by day. It eats the flesh and bone by turns, but it eats the heart alway. For three long years they will not sow or root or seedling there. For three long years the unblessed spot will sterile be and bare and look upon the wandering sky with unreproachful stare. They think a murderer's heart would taint each simple seed they sow. It is not true. God's kindly earth is kindlier than men know. And the red rose would but blow more red, the white rose whiter blow. Out of his mouth a red, red rose, out of his heart a white. For who can say by what strange way Christ brings his will to light, since the barren staff the pilgrim bore bloomed in the great Pope's sight? But neither milk white rose nor red may bloom in prison air. The shard, the pebble, and the flint are what they give us there. For flowers have been known to heal a common man's despair. So never will wine red rose or white petal by petal fall on that stretch of mud and sand that lies by the hideous prison wall to tell the men who tramp the yard that God's son died for all. Yet though the hideous prison wall still hems him round and round, and a spirit may not walk by night that is with fetters bound, and a spirit may but weep that lies in such unholy ground, he is at peace, this wretched man, at peace or will be soon. There is no thing to make him mad, nor does terror walk at noon. For the lampless earth in which he lies has neither sun nor moon. They hanged him as a beast is hanged. They did not even toll a requiem that might have brought rest to his startled soul. But hurriedly they took him out and hid him in a hole. They stripped him of his canvas clothes and gave him to the flies. They mocked the swollen purple throat and the stark and staring eyes. And with laughter loud, they heaped the shroud in which their convict lies. The chaplain would not kneel to pray by his dishonored grave, nor mark it with that blessed cross that Christ for sinners gave, because the man was one of those whom Christ came down to save. Yet all is well, he has but passed to life's appointed born, and alien tears will fill for him pity's long broken urn, for his mourners will be outcast men, and outcasts always mourn. I'll see you tomorrow for the final part. Thanks for watching.
Five. The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde, parts five and six. I know not whether laws be right or whether laws be wrong. All that we know who lie in jail is that the wall is strong and that each day is like a year, a year whose days are long. But this I know, that every law that men have made for man, since first man took his brother's life, and the sad world began, but straws the wheat and saves the chaff, with the most evil fan. This too I know, and why as it were if each could know the same, that every prison that men build is built with bricks of shame and bound with bars lest Christ should see how men their brothers maim. With bars they blur the gracious moon and blind the goodly sun. And they do well to hide their hell, for in it things are done that son of God nor son of man ever should look upon. Vilest deeds like poison weeds bloom well in prison air, it is only what is good in man that wastes and withers there. Pale anguish keeps the heavy gate, and the warder is despair. For they starve the little frightened child till it weeps both night and day. And they scourge the weak, and flog the fool, and jibe the old and gray. And some grow mad, and all grow bad, and none a word may say. Each narrow cell in which we dwell is a foul and dark latrine, and the fetid breath of living death chokes up each grated stream, and all but lust is turned to dust in humanity's machine. The brackish water that we drink creeps with a loathsome slime, and the bitter bread they weigh in scales is full of chalk and lime. And sleep will not lie down, but walks wild-eyed and cries to time. But though lean hunger and green thirst like asp with adder fight, we have little care of prison fare, for what chills and kills outright is that every stone one lifts by day becomes one's heart by night. With midnight always in one's heart, and twilight in one's cell. We turn the crank or tear the rope, each in his separate hell. And the silence is more awful far than the sound of a brazen bell. And never a human voice comes near to speak a gentle word. And the eye that watches through the door is pitiless and hard. And by all forgot, we rot and rot with soul and body marred. And thus we rust life's iron chain, degraded and alone. And some men curse, and some men weep, and some men make no moan. But God's eternal laws are kind, and break the heart of stone. And every human heart that breaks in prison cell or yard is as that broken box that gave its treasure to the Lord and filled the unclean leper's house with the scent of costliest nard. Ah, happy they whose hearts can break and peace of pardon win. How else may man make straight his plan and cleanse his soul from sin? How else but through a broken heart may Lord Christ enter in? And he of the swollen purple throat and the stark and staring eyes waits for the holy hands that took the thief to paradise. And a broken and a contrite heart the Lord will not despise. The man in red who reads the law gave him three weeks of life, three little weeks in which to heal his soul of his soul strife and cleanse from every blot of blood the hand that held the knife. And with tears of blood he cleansed the hand, the hand that held the steel. For only blood can wipe out blood, and only tears can heal. And the crimson stain that was of Cain became Christ's snow-white seal. 
In Reading Jail, by Reading Town, there is a pit of shame, and in it lies a wretched man, eaten by teeth of flame. In a burning, winding sheet he lies, and his grave has got no name. And there, till Christ call forth the dead, in silence let him lie. No need to waste the foolish tear, or heave the windy sigh. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. And all men kill the thing they love, by all let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. A coward does it with a kiss, a brave man with a sword. Now we shall move on to the work, The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde. Seems interesting because actually Reading Jail is the name of a jail. It's situated in Berkshire in England. I have referred that but I have never connected it so. So the poem is actually, you know, it's actually one of the Victorian poems, The Ballad of Reading Jail. And now we shall look into the biographical details of Oscar Wilde as a poet. Okay, so as I have mentioned in the last class, there will be some aspects, some key features from the biography, which will be useful for our poetry too. Right, so here we are looking some of the important factors which is applicable to our poem. Now, Oscar Wilde was an Irish author, playwright, and poet. After writing in different forms throughout 1880s, he became one of London's most popular playwrights in the early 1890s. We have discussed it in Victorian literature, right? He was one of the main playwright of the Victorian era, and he's of I Irish origin, right? And he was born on 1854 in Dublin and died in 1900. And um, many facts like that, he married Constance Lloyd. The couple had two sons. So coming to the main part of which we need, homosexuality. In 1891, Wilde met Lord Alfred Douglas. They became lovers. Alfred's father, John Douglas, did not approve of his son's relationship and feuding which means quarreling between John Douglas and Wilde eventually led to Wilde being convicted of, convict, I mean, convicted of gross indecency for homosexual acts. Wilde was sentenced to two years of hard labor. This is actually the scenario which we are concerned or the background which we should understand while analyzing the poem, The Ballad of Reading Jail. Okay. Despite he was, I mean, he was homosexual, though he was married and had uh, two children. And uh, he was suggestive of this, this fact in his work, which I have mentioned in the earlier slide of uh, Victorian era. I hope you remember it. Now you just revisit it, you will understand it better. Right. Uh, he regarded it as an after effect of the confusions, conflicts of the Victorian society. Now, despite Wilde's preference for men and the social scandal caused by his trial and imprisonment, Wilde and his wife never divorced and he wrote plays and short stories, but only one novel. His only novel is The Picture of Dorian Gray, which is also a controversial, I mean, and also a famous novel, though it's only a single novel. It's, it also uh, contains many uh, erotic homosexual aspects embedded in it and so this is one of the key aspects which we should keep in mind while reading the poem now he rose up society's ranks in london he's of irish origin right so you might be wondering how he comes here now uh, although born irish and in dublin Oscar Wilde skillfully entered high society with his popular wit and playwriting skills. He's actually very much, very, I mean, uh, sorry, I, uh, very much renowned, not only in Ireland, but he, have to, he has traveled into North America as a proponent of aestheticism, which we are going to see in a short while. And he was that much popular in the whole Europe, actually. He was considered as an early Victorian celebrity and became well-known throughout Europe and the British Isles. See, 
he was deemed a larger than life character and his outrageous outfits were often the subjects of cartoon satire now he was an advocate of aestheticism in victorian era we have to associate many of the poets either to pre raphaelite brotherhood or to aestheticism here uh, oscar wilde was also in a way supportive to pre raphaelite brotherhood but he is mostly regarded as the proponent of aestheticism so it is better to place him here uh, pre raphaelite brotherhood will be more meaningful if we place dante gabriel rossetti there okay in the aesthetic movement of the 19th century argued that art should exist for art sake only so here comes actually earlier it was the art was used as a means of self improvement as a propagation so artists many artists had a reaction against it pre raphaelite brotherhood was also a subsidiary of such a reaction for art for art sake they also had this same a uh, motif and this art for art sake was against art as any sort of self improvement or any sort of message or like that so art was only for art sake without any sort of political agenda while sesay's plays novels led the aesthetic movement for other artists and he was a prominent example of this movement for other authors writing in the 19th century he wrote more than just aesthetic work he was not only a playwright poet uh and uh, novelist he wrote essays also he says say the soul of man under socialism argues that capitalism crushes creativity as people are so focused on solving the social problems caused by capitalism now you can connect most of the isms of victorian era industrialization capitalism and many works in reaction to such social facts now these are the works uh, some of the works are very much famous the picture of dorian gray novel and he's also a children stories writer many of the stories uh, some of you might be familiar with the canterville ghost we had it in our syllabus i think in cbse schools plus 1 or plus 2 and a partial list of plays the, these are the famous plays by by oscar wilde the duchess of padua lady wintermere's fan a woman of no importance an ideal husband the importance of being earnest which is very famous so these are the major works have a look at it mention uh, at least the novel for critical analysis okay now coming to the ballad of reading jail now actually what is a ballad we shall begin with that ballad is actually it's an earlier form where it employs the narrative method okay it was a earlier minstrel form uh, it will have 6 to 8 8 6 6 8 uh, like a pattern and it will be uh, we have already discussed in the victorian poetry characteristics they employed the narrative technique because it was in a time of the novel bloom right so it is a kind of verse uh, in narrative nature and there will be a mus- musical effect as a result of this pattern okay so it will be clear now the title will be familiar at least at least the title will be familiar for you the ballad of reading jail reading jail is actually the name of the jail so here while depicts a very dark murder scene with the theme of scarlet blood and wine here in the poem the color the symbolism of color is very much prevalent there is red there is yellow and we shall see it later each stanza brings a new comparison between this criminal story and our denied reality the prison is shown with bright whites and the summer days with blues and yellows the only real thing that is left concrete is the scarlet red jacket it shows that the story crosses over to reality so reading for the first time you may not understand what it means actually i will just uh, ha- give it short limbs of what the poem is the poem actually begins with charles woolrich i have already mentioned he's the uh, homosexual companion of uh, wild and also uh, sorry uh, no he's the inmate of the jail uh, inmate of oscar wild extremely sorry i misspelled the name uh, so he is actually the inmate this is actually a real incident the man has been i mean this charles woolrich 
this man has been sentenced to hang and uh, he goes about his life in prison so this this experience of wild and his inmate woldrich is actually this point wild and the other men are actually jealous of this prisoner this woldrich because he accepts very much openly he accepts willfully we uh, that he's going to be hanged the context is that while and other wild and other men are actually jealous of his attitude that he accepts his fate see this are uh, this is the actual context of the poem and this poem employs many themes like uh, loss imprisonment emotional turbulence and many themes are like that uh, present in this poem so the baller background of the poem is here the background was written by wild after his release uh, from prison 19 uh, in 1898 uh, it portrays the exp- portrays his experience in prison of witnessing the ex- execution of a murderer his inmate is charles woolrich and the incident is actually he slit his wife's throat with a razor out of jealousy so we are going to see how this happened is it real he is uh, did he do it intentionally or not okay and we shall find the explanation of stanzas first the ballad is grouped into six parts this ballad actually has got six parts the first part is the inmate who murdered his wife is introduced as well as a wider perspective on men who all kill the thing they love so this is one of the main theme the cyclical theme of this poem all kill the thing they love it's a contrary he actually didn't do it intentionally he was intoxicated he had taken wine and he actually slit the throat of his wife and uh, from that moment onwards he started to regret uh, he feels that he's actually deserving for the punishment so he accepts that punishment so willfully wistfully right okay the circumstances is, the prisoners lived in is described further describes this inmate his six weeks he had left to, to leave and the other prisoners fear of death the conditions inside and outside of prison is contrasted so this poem is so emotional uh, with uh, emotional turbulence uh, or overflow of emotions okay elaborates on how the prisoners discovered his grave awaiting him and how it appears as if he enjoy his last few days the identification of the prisoners experience with this inmate is portrayed as well as the passage of time from day and night so this whole poem is about this inmates awaiting for their friends i mean uh, their friend friends i mean by apostrophe s okay friends hanging or execution okay the prisoners sorrow is revealed as they observe the fresh grave the stripping and mocking of the deceased by the prison staff actually so he is hanged uh, in in between the stanzas we will find that charles is hanged and along with his burial is described here with wild illustrates that the murderous punishment continues even after his death due to how he was hurriedly and cruelly buried without any prayers or ceremony it ends with the execution in the early morning hours while refers to the prison system which needs to be reformed the bad which good men try to extinguish only grows and their hearts only get heavier with time he mentions only faith in god lightens their heart and their only way of esca- escaping is to die the final section shifts to common guilt of all men it ends with the repetitive thought of how all men kill the thing they love only in different ways so this is actually the whole synopsis of the stanzas you will only understand this poem when you read as a whole it's so simple in the usual language which you can cover in one sitting itself actually it's of 109 lines are there but so we cannot explain it line by line this is actually the synopsis of the six sections okay so can you change the slide please so the deep analysis of the poem so before going into 
uh, this deep analysis let me uh, let me just give a brief intro here the poem actually is about i i said it's about charles who murdered his wife okay so he has been sentenced to hang and other men are jealous of his admitting this thing okay so this is actually the single thread of the poem so now we can analyze first of all how we shall analyze the poem uh, by you by categorizing it with various characteristics of the victorian poetry first is the narrative form i have already mentioned it it uses the narrative form the ballad itself is a narrative form of poetry so it's actually suited for the title the ballad, victorians took great interest in narrative and ballad form so it has got 109 stanzas with six lines each okay with strong narrative thrust now characteristics of the ballad there are many things which we can acclaim uh, to this poem uh for categorizing it as a ballad it has repetition uh, the the main line which i said in the previous slide it is actually the repetition each man kills the thing he loves okay it is repeated repeated in many stanzas to emphasize the major theme of it to emphasize upon the innocence of the man and by innocence i mean actually he regrets for what he does he is actually very much regretted when he knows he actually murdered his wife so though he regrets so much there is nothing to save the man nothing to console they face harsh uh, treatment from uh, prison uh, while itself actually uh, by the planning of his homosexual partner's father get into this prison so the ill treatments the all the inmates face in this prison is uh, very keenly portrayed in this poem okay now an element of pathos through diction the suffering of the prisoners are revealed this is what i was saying for example i and all the souls in pain everyone was there in much pain so that that agony emotions uh, all are portrayed in this poem and that may man's face was gray gray with emotion emotionally rousing and visual evocative emo- imagery so it's filled with imagery for blood and wine are red this is the line i was suggesting earlier for blood and wine are red the blood which came as he slit the throat of his wife and wine he was intoxicated he didn't do it intentionally it evokes an image of the color red which can symbolize the violence of the murder imagery of the dark and terrifying grave which awaits the convict is provoked by the use of with yawning mouth the yellow hole so another color yellow gave to for a living thing so we shall move on to the next slide so religious decay this is uh, another important aspect so because uh, the i saw one previous year question based on this religious decay i have already said in this victorian era there was a questioning against the religion as a whole uh, by the production of darwin's the origin of species the victorian age was marked by the religious decay through the allusion to bible wild incorporates the characteristic of lack of spiritual unity or brotherhood among men for wild it was wicked for man to take punishment into their own hands while god judges all sins equally so man becomes the ultimate powers in this world other than the god god is always regarded as or uh, the all forgiving right Uh, repentant loving and here the, in this poem a pure portrayal of religious decay is i mean religious decay is evident he did not wear his scarlet coat the, all these lines are suggestive of one or the other biblical allusions or lines from the bible okay so uh, the lines he mentioned in the poem will have another version from the bible so it is closely connecting and uh, everything will be a, Uh, attributed to some or the other way to pessimism he did not wear his scarlet coat he did not wear his scarlet coat they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him contrast guilty prisoner with jesus who was innocent i hope you understood it the prisoner is at a, what the prisoner is compared to jesus himself who was innocent so scarlet coat it is a bl- biblical allusion and bitter wine upon a sponge was the savior of remorse 
immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed so this is a comparison of the biblical line and also the poem uh, poem the ballad of reading jail since first man took his brother's life so there are many lines like this uh, which we can see uh, closely linked to bible okay so everything in one way or the other showcases how religion is decayed deteriorated deteriorated and man overpowers over all the religious aspects okay and the final line the cover does it with a kiss this is an important line which we are uh, focusing upon because it is one of the artists for the exam and uh, we shall see it in the final section okay can you change the slide please okay questions concerning homosexuality i think i am taking too much time uh questions concerning homosexuality is also mentioned in this poem here fatima uh, just don't need to move faster okay you are explaining very well okay we have time okay, okay. don't worry okay fine okay i thought uh, the many poems of robert browning is also it to cover so i am working a bit for if something is moving on at a very great great explanation just to keep it on okay don't worry about it we have one more days also okay okay so, okay fine okay fine now so uh, I, i hope uh, is there any doubt for this concept of religious decay it's actually nothing but the lines in the poem it, it will be more clear if you read the poem at least once because the lines in the poem is actually an alternative of the biblical lines okay there will be some connection to that biblical line i have correctly associated that line with the biblical line so once you read the poem it will be very much clear there is nothing uh, to ex explain more here uh, because it's all small lines explaining emotions explaining his agony uh, explaining the innocence of the prisoner but it actually in a deeper level what it projects the religious decay so there are many lines instances of the poem showing this this was i was explaining this uh, in the previous slide, slide okay now questions concerning homosexuality so in the biographical details we have also already covered about this and in the poem also it presents clearly the victorian age was marked by tremendous upheaval in sex and homosexuality practices while homosexuality may also be portrayed in this ballad in none knew so well as i for he who lives more lives than one more deaths than one must die while might be referring to his own life in which he had to hide his sexuality and lead a double life we have mentioned it in victorian era uh, the characteristics okay so uh, here uh, the homosexuality which uh, wild projects in the poem he mentions it as a direct influence of the uh, victorian prudery okay now the moral decay of course in a era of this much uh, repression this much constraints there will be rather more moral decay if that much stringent rules are applied on the society there will be of course reaction to such norms okay mid victorians were preoccupied with questions surrounding the moral and social ramification of aesthetic values and so the society as defined by ambition and greed it was an age of industrialization money centered age so people was looking after money more greedy more ambitious right there was an overall concern regarding the dehumanizing effects of industrial capitalism while it expresses this questioning of morality through metonymy personification simile so these are the literary devices used in this poem what i am you uh, i want to convey now is that we have discussed many points now th through this deep analysis we have discussed narrative form how the ballad characteristics are acclaimed to this poem how this religious decay is clearly portrayed in this poem and how uh this homosexuality concerns are presented in the poem how moral decay is shown in the poem all these things are covered through many literary devices like metonymy 
personification simile okay these are the devices by which he conveys these themes efficiently so metonymy is actually one thing standing for the other for uh, easy understanding i might say we, we we may say the white house for the us president okay so such a comparison is actually called the metonymy i hope you understand uh, when a voice behind me whispered low that fellows go to swing the voice here represents society's immoral laws they enforce as they get to decide who lives who dies uh, and never a human voice comes near to speak a gentle word this voice represents humanity who disregard the importance of morals such as kindness so it is clearly su- suggestive of the then social evils the then cultural conflicts the then social norms faced by the people during the victorian era you might be familiar with all those uh, prudery and repression of the uh, victorian era i have been chanting these words again and again from the beginning onwards right so personification now personification you already uh, might be knowing giving animal qualities to humans some uh, uh, sorry G- giving human qualities a uh, personifying a thing some strangle with the hands of lust some with the hands of gold while protest the power of these elements as consequence of ca- industrial capitalism have as they can cause the hurt and the decay of morality this is what i was suggesting through this literary devices the, most of these themes are efficiently with a thrust are conveyed okay simile they hanged him as a beast his hand this shows how fellow brothers were treated like animals without any respect so the whole poem uh, is about humanizing uh, the prisoners emotion the prisoners life the prisoners you know, the ill treatments the exploitation they face at least uh, the the ones who regret uh, they they are not even given a chance to treat as humans they are very much ill treated uh, they will hate their life it is very much Uh, hard and dark so the poem is whole in a dark and a hard situation now you might understand the beginning slide the beginning slide with the scarlet red the dark imagery might be unfamiliar when you read it for the first time after reading the whole slides now you just go and read it will be definitely a good critical analysis for your answers okay now moving on to the final slide can you oh, okay previous year questions now i have seen only one rtc uh, i don't know if i have missed anyone i uh, in my collection i have seen this rtc yet each man kills the thing he loves here the murderer kills the thing he loves he loves her very much he was in- intoxicated this is actually a real incident uh, so this the, the poem is actually realistic of uh, wiles prison experience and the inmates experience okay by each let this be heard some do it with a bitter look some with a flattering word the coward does it with a kiss the brave man with a sword he has faced his fate of execution with a sword with much willful mind with confidence okay so now the second question would you agree with the point of view that oscar wilde's the ballad of reading gaol sorry reading jail suggests the futility of christian ethics and laws of faith in christianity so this this is where the po- all the points all the lines commenting between uh, uh, the religious dk the biblical lines and the uh, lines from the po- poem both is suggestive okay so i guess you understood the poem thank you so much